Welcome once again. My name is Felipe, creative director here at MakerBot, and I'll be joined by Landis Fields. I'll let him introduce himself. As you can see, people are super excited and from all over the place, uh, eager to hear what you're going to be sharing with us today. Uh, with that, take it away. It's great to be here. My name is Landis Fields. I'm real-time principal creative in Industrial Light Magic. I get to work across all of Lucasfilm and ILM projects, things that pertain to real time, but also I'm in the front of the production where I get to work with all the design and, and work with the writers and everybody. And then how that transitions into when we do a lot of the design work inside of VR uh, in the Unreal game engine. And then how that transitions into the whole stagecraft suite when we shoot on set for the LED volume. Even if you're new to 3D printing or if you're a professional, we've actually got some rock stars from ILM and from Techno Props. I know Robbie Derry was watching. There's a, you know, a variety of people who are tuning in right now. So if you're new to this, there's something for everybody. And if you're a pro, there's some stuff in here that's some goodies as well. So, uh, and that'll be kind of the theme as I go through. So I'm gonna go through a few examples today. Um, and, and you can see here, I called it world building with 3D printing. And the reason that I put that there is if you see a lot of the stuff, and I don't know how many of you guys have watched the gallery episodes of how, you know, the behind the scenes of all of the people that work on these projects and how we build these worlds. But it, it, it is very true as we get granular in this presentation today with 3D printing specifically. Uh, you'll see one of the common themes that I'll, I'll touch on as we go through all of the slides is something that we say on set all the time in The Mandalorian. And, and, and whether you use stagecraft, whether you're using any of the different things that we use, um, we always have a central theme that's kind of the, the, the North Star for us. And that's you use the right tool for the job. So you're going to see that. I'm going to show some stuff from really nice Connex machines from Stratasys, who is obviously the parent company of MakerBot. Um, but we're also going to show some stuff here that's like FDM machines, stuff that you have at home, like a Replicator Plus or even maybe a homemade 3D printer that you might have. So you'll see that it's about the right tool for the job and you use whatever you have access to. So I'll, I'll be showing a variety of that stuff. Um, and you can see the little bullet points down at the bottom. I'm going to show you a couple of things from virtual production. And, and what I mean by that is I'm not going to show you just a pretty maquette. I'm going to show you how we use printing for using uh, for planning job shoots, uh, how we're going to use 3D printing for making some of our gear that we use. Also, how we figure out designs for maquettes, visual effects, how we use it for stand-ins, for lighting on set. Um, and also, of course, props and miniatures, which is what people think of usually when they think of 3D printing, but I brought a couple other little goodies to tie it all together as well. But it all is around that theme of world building. We use the right tool for the job to get the job done. The first thing I have here that I brought, and you've seen these images before. If you guys tuned in for the one where we did for the big STEM program, I've showed this. These are a few images that I, I, I might have these on my Instagram site as well. But this is, I, I wanted to show this first because when a lot of people are new to 3D printing, and I know there are a few in here for that, so I wanted to address that on this first slide. A lot of folks, even if they're professionals in the industry, ask me the same question. They're always, what's the best printer to get? They then lead down this path, and it's just assumptions that they're filling in the blanks, that the printer needs to make the thing that you've got in the computer, and it needs to just come out pristine like some kind of sci-fi movie. And there are, you can do that. Depending on the printer that you have, you can print all the little cables and all the little antennas. But truth be told, we don't do that. What we do is we figure out, again, the right tool for the job. We turn all those antennas off. We turn all those cables off. We add those with wire after the fact. So as you're thinking about this stuff, and even if you're a professional and you're trying to kind of take it to the next level, think about how you can use printing as a tool. Remember I said it's the right tool for the job. This isn't the whole toolbox. It's just another hammer, it's another screwdriver. Um, and that goes true with the printer processes we use. We use resin printers, we use FDM machines, we use all of that stuff. And again, it's not which one's better. Um, so that top one there, that top row, that's a marble statue um, that we did at work. And I actually have some of the pieces. This is what came out. So this is on one of the, the, the big, the big kid Stratasys machine. So this is a Connex machine. And what's really cool is it can print in different materials. If you had access to this, you probably don't have this at home. This is something that you would pay for the prints uh, at, a, at a printing service. Um, but what's really cool about this is this is what I want to show you is you see how it looks kind of like it's a faux bronze, we call it. It's a bronze paint job that I did in those images on the top. But when it came out, it looks like this weird kind of bone material and it can also print clear it can print like flexible materials you can fade from like a rigid plastic to a flexible material things you couldn't do if you weren't printing it's almost like you're kind of feathering or fading from two different things like a plastic to a rubber um so it's pretty cool and then this thing if you want to know kind of the story behind it um a bunch of us worked on dr strange together 
one of the guys that I worked with, the, the VFX supervisor, Richard Bluff, um, we, we worked on that show, Dr. Strange One, and, and there was a bunch of kaleidoscoping buildings. So we thought it'd be really cool to have a statue to kind of come, you know, to celebrate all of the stuff that we had done. So that is the Houdini solves that we used in the film on the bottom of that base of all the New York buildings kind of kaleidoscoping on themselves. On all of that stuff, it's the real deal. And the reason we printed clear on the conics at first, Evan Atherton at Autodesk printed this, um, was because we wanted to see, uh, we might had put a light in it, but we didn't put a light. So we ended up doing that painting. So I wanted you to see if you're printing, you can paint things, make them look uh, however you want. It doesn't matter what material you're using, or what color. And this bottom one here, we'll get, get into it. But this bottom one, the reason I put those images on there is this is a bunch of, this is the hybrid thing. And we do this a lot. This is the right tool for the job. That's the segue into the slides here. So those bottom image, uh, images are some pieces are 3D printed. Some of those are like plastic gelato spoons that you would just throw in the garbage after you would eat uh, ice cream. So there's a turkey baster in there. There's razors, like disposable razors for engines. So this is a 3D print cladded kit bashed ship out of things that have been 3D printed, found objects. And that's the gold at Industrial Light and Magic. There's so many legends that are at that company and with the company, the giants, the, uh, the shoulders of the giants were standing on that see the world a little bit differently. Um, and they see shapes. They find things that it doesn't matter what color they are. They might find some little scrap thing that they like those gelato spoons, I think were like fluorescent pink. But when you put those on there and you see that shape and you look past that color, you can then spray that stuff gray and then you'll give it a whole uh, cohesive paint job to kind of tie it all together, whether it be rust or whatever. But I want you to just be thinking about that stuff even after this, after you go and do your own thing where you can be like, hey, I could 3D print this part, but I could glue on this other thing. That's that's what you want to be thinking like. If for those of you who don't know what virtual production is, it's basically like the planning out of the story. And we do that with a variety of techniques. And you'll see at the end, I've got some where we've scanned some things. We get in virtual reality and we scout remotely all over the world. We'll have somebody, I do it every day. I'll be in a VR headset. Somebody will be in London. Somebody will be in Vancouver. Somebody will be in Los Angeles. And we're flying around a real world of things that we scan. It looks, it, it looks amazing. It looks photo real. So we use printing to help us with some of that stuff, with, with the shoots and planning the shoots. One of the things that we do, this is just a, a this is the juggernaut ship from the Mandalorian. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but this was basically, there was a sequence that we needed to figure out where there were kind of, there was some pirates and they're fighting uh, Mando on the roof of this thing as it was going. And it had this kind of like precious material on it that could explode if they go too fast and all of this stuff. And Mayfield was driving. So we needed to plan that out. This isn't anything fancy from the Conics machine. This is just the, the juggernaut being printed on a replicator plus. So anybody who thinks, oh, when you're in the big, movie industry and all of that stuff, you're probably using the big expense stuff. We use it all, right? And you can see the art department there, two talented artists from the art department are assembling it, gluing it together, putting it on a stand. All of this stuff needs to be meticulous to scale because we are trying to figure out a shoot. And what this helped us plan out is this sequence here. This was um, orchestrated by Richard Bluff in the, in the third floor at Previs and the director to kind of figure all this out in the back lot. And you can see these guys had to figure out how to jump from this thing. Now, this is the final visual effects shot here, um, but you can see that little cross dissolve of the, of the blue screen of what we shot on the back lot. Here's another part um, where they're on the roof of that vehicle. And I think it's super interesting to see how it's all part of a super big process. As you were saying, like 3D printing is just one of the steps, one of the tools that you might end up using. Uh, you know, it's not only, I think sometimes we forget that with a printer, you, you just get a blank object. There's a lot of things that need to happen afterwards, whether it's painting, finishing it, assembling it, or even using it just as a standing or as a prop later on for, for the proper or the final shoot, right? That's right. That's absolutely right. So that was that sequence. Another thing that we do with virtual production is we print out gear, as I mentioned, and you can't talk about that without mentioning the gold standard. This is the Techno Props headset, and I actually have one here. And I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'm actually in the process of, and I know he's listening, I'm in the process of trying to convince Robbie Derry to share their magic with you guys. So you guys got to pressure him if you find out who he is. He's, he, right now he's rolling his eyes. So um, this is the, the gold standard. These guys use all types of printing. They print the headset. They make injection molds from it. They, they make um, actual electronics and housing for those electronics. So 
um, Disney's Technoprops is, is, like I said, the gold standard for 3D printing and manufacturing things. And this headset, it might seem like you could put like a bicycle helmet on and bungee cord a phone to it. But right. when you have to wear this thing and the talent has to wear it, it has to stay on your head. You can't have chin straps in front of your face. There's a lot of engineering that goes into this. And they've actually won a lot of awards for this, but it uses all types of printing, machining on this thing. It's, it's, a, it's a work of art. But as I've always said, if you don't have access to that stuff, right? You can do stuff at home as well. So this is actually, and I don't have the credit in here for this. Mm. This is a part that I printed off of Thingiverse. On the Method X, I printed out of the, the, the carbon fiber material. Um, this was so that I could have the Quest, and I can't remember the guy's name that printed this, but you guys can find it, and I'll, and I'll have them share it later. Um, he made a little adapter. What I needed was, because I'm in VR all day, to scout, right, to plan out all these shoots in, in, in Unreal. I needed a way to have a better headset, the, the better strap on the Quest 2. And the one that comes with it is okay, but it's not, it's not great. This one from the Vibe is one of the ones that is, is, is a favorite headset from a, everybody that uses VR every day, all day, right? right. So this was a, a, a part that you could print and it held on that headset and it's called a FrankenQuest is kind of the term on, uh, you know, out there for that. So again, you don't have to have this crazy machines, to, these machines to do this. Truth be told, I did this on the Method X because I wanted to do it out of carbon fiber. It's nice and strong, but you could have done this out of PLA or whatever on, on a Replicator Plus or whatever printer you guys have at home. 3D printing for design. So that was the virtual production aspect. You can actually use printer. And like, remember I was saying, you could add things to them, put wires on them. You can also put clay on them. So when Doug Chang and Tony McVeigh was the one that did the sculpt for this, was looking to do the Bantha. We were gonna do a full size Bantha from Legacy. Legacy was gonna, and we did, we built it. It was beautiful, Legacy did a great job. When Tony went to start to do the maquette sculpt of that, we wanted to pay homage to George because George had, um, the Bantha was the dressed up elephants. So what we did was I 3D printed an elephant that was just on the Replicator Plus, again, nothing fancy. And then Tony was able to sculpt on top of that. So we knew that the proportions were right. And then we en ended up scanning that maquette. And you'll see as this thing spins around, you can see the cross section of where the elephant fits into that. And then that was then that scan was then delivered to Legacy and Legacy made the giant full size buck. It was huge. It had all this fur on it. And I don't know if you guys were at the uh, Mandalorian experience at Celebration last week, but we had that on display and Legacy was even controlling it with the animatronics and everything. It was beautiful. I saw the videos of it, but talk about it going full circle, right? Where you literally print something, scan it, and then take it back into the, into the computer. To we do that all the time, that round trip. Uh, of things where you you print and even that first spaceship that I showed you when I kit bashed all that stuff out of some print parts and some basically mm -hmm. garbage we then scan it in bring it into the computer and I'll show you an example at the very end of this presentation where we did that and it's kind of a really nice uh, full circle example 3d printed visual effects stand-ins so another thing that a lot of people don't know that we do is we print full-size creatures in that that aren't necessarily going to be props but they're there for lighting reference for visual effects. Mm -hmm. So, and, and here's another little cool feather in the cap here that I think you guys will enjoy. We do that a lot of times where we bring back things from the Lucasfilm archives that may have been featured in the prequels or whatever other shows. And we want to, and, and as you guys know, Dave Filoni and John Favreau is really big on keeping that rich story and environment and, and, and telling more background about these characters and what happened to them later. So one of the things we wanted to do with the Tuscans was to have that lizard dog, the massive, Mm -hmm. and revisit the show so that thing's not very big i don't know if you can see but that little color chart that i have there next to it i mean that's an apple box underneath it if, for those of you who are familiar with film stuff and know what that it size is that little color chart is only about as big you know a little bit bigger than a deck of cards so that thing's not very big but we wanted to have it full scale on set for lighting reference for when we when ilm does the full cg dogs on those things running around this was the scan that came out of that and what we did to 3D print this, I didn't want to just bandsaw it wherever. It already has natural. And if you're 3D printing creatures or props or anything, those that are more professional know this. But if you're getting started, I hid those lines of chopping this up in these natural folds of that creature. So that way I don't owe some kind of bondo or any kind of stuff right on a hero aspect of this thing. Yeah. That also, you know, there's times when I could have printed this more of it, but I chopped it up in a more granular way so that I could avoid having support material and blemishes on hero areas. So the fact that this thing was that kind of layered armadillo look allowed me to chop that up. And what's really cool in this next image when you see, this is the print of the head. I think the print of the head was done on the Z18. 
Mm -hmm. And then what's really cool about this little cart here, not only as you guys probably can imagine now, and if you're a pro, you know this, we print with whatever material you have if you're going to paint it, right? If you have white laying around, you have gray laying around. But what's fascinating about that little cart is that it's not just because that was the printer material we had. We crowdsourced this print all over. So we had some printers running in Los Angeles, we had some printers running in San Francisco, and then we assembled them all uh, in San Francisco. And then Doug Chang had Tony McVeigh uh, do the paint job on this guy. And it came out really good. And this was also featured at the Mandalorian experience as well. But what was really neat was that was a scan taken from something that was small that we then brought in, chopped it up, printed it, blew it up full size of how it was meant to be. That's kind of wild. And it's a really nice tip of the hat to the, to the past. It's amazing. It's also super Another, interesting to see how you actually end up assembling things, no matter if you're talking about like something very abstract, like sometimes we tend to host webinars about more engineering parts, gears and whatnot. But here you're also talking about that same idea of it's rare that you have a single print do the whole job for you, but rather you end up having to have to assemble a lot of multiple, multiple components to you know present the final product. Yeah, and Jay Machado, I would send him a file. Now we have MakerBot Cloud Print. I don't know if for those of you who are in the MakerBot system, but mm -hmm. at the time we didn't have that. So Jay and I just through, through the means of, of, of works infrastructure, I would send him, it was kind of like a clunky version of a 3D fax for those of you who are old enough to know what even a fax machine is. <laughs> um, but I would send him a file. He would kick it off on the Z18 and then Jay would keep me posted and say, hey, is it, is it still working? Is it still running? That way I'd know if anything if we had any problems we, if failure or if we ran out of material or something, I would kick that part off in another one because we had a deadline that we had to hit. And then that ultimately, if, if you guys missed it, if you just tuned in or whatever, that was something that we brought that full size maquette down on set and it was filmed in the lighting of the LED volume. Or if we were shooting on the back lot, it was filmed. So that way visual effects knows how the light is reacting to that thing for when we put the full CG ones in there. Mm -hmm. It was same size, but the we want to have the CG ones in there. Similar thing we did with the ice spider. So this is a Ralph, for those of you who are fans, this is an original Ralph McCrory painting over here of this ice spider. And Doug is phenomenal with this kind of stuff. Doug's been around since, you know, he worked with Ralph McCrory, um, Doug Chang. So he and, and John and Dave, they wanted to bring yet again, another character back to the screen. So what we knew we were going to have to need was we're going to have to have CG versions of these, right? Because they crawl crazy all over, but we also needed multiple sizes. So we printed this on an FDM machine. Um, we also printed it, as you can see on a form labs, little resin printer, because we needed like the little baby spiders, but they were to be to scale. That baby spider that was printed was going to be what we intended the visual effects one to be so that we brought both of those on set. And here you can see Fonco Studios, they did a wonderful job. They took those prints. I, I printed the, the torso of this big one here that you can see them assembling it. And I printed one leg. Fawn then took those, made copies of them. Again, see, it's the right tool for the job. Could you print all the legs? Sure. But what's nice about making copies is he was able to then string through a, a stronger um, armature through them so that it could hold its own weight. Otherwise, it would bust on its own, its own weight. He also threaded in underneath on the mouth a quarter 20 bolt so that we could mount that on a tripod, bring it in in between yeah. shoots, visual effects could shoot that for lighting reference. And then down here, you could see the little baby one that the guy was painting there as well. Um, 3D printed props. So those two things that I just showed you in case you missed what I said, those were stand-ins, right? Those are things that somebody might go up to them and, and, and kind of walk by them and interact. But for the most part, we know those are gonna be CG replacements later. We just need them to look right in that scene. 3D props are a little bit different. Those are things that we are going to interact with. This was one of the millipedes that we ended up printing this and ultimately making a mold to have like a jelly version of this thing so that they could like chew it and eat it. And this was a design that Doug and I did. I remember we, we were working on this thing at Video Village right there on set. I had my laptop and I was sculpting while we were, Video Village is basically where all the monitors are when you're watching what's being shot right behind you. So I was working, on, it was right down to the wire and working on this thing. Doug's like a little bit more here, a little bit more there. And then we kicked this thing off in the printer right there. Um, we actually used uh, Josh props, uh, Josh Roth. He's the prop master on the show. He, luckily he had the wash and cure machine right there and the, the resin printer. So we were able to turn that around really fast. Um, but you can see that that's a pretty big millipede from how it is in my hand. Here's one that's kind of fun. So again, you know, that was a resin print. It's the right tool for the job. Here's a print that was done on a variety of machines. So this one up here on the left, this was a Z18. Mm -hmm. This one here in the middle is actually two parts. It's kind of hard to tell, but I kind of packed it in there. That was the Replicator X. And then this front face of this droid was the Replicator X. This is an entire droid head that we wanted as a prop that was going to be shot on camera. 
and we were going to clad on wires. And this is Josh Roth. I told you from Josh Props. He's down here in a second. But what I want to show you guys is this is an FDM machine. And sometimes people say, oh, it's going to have build lines. I can't do anything with it. Look at that. After you get somebody who just rolls up their sleeves and gets a little sandpaper out, that thing's beautiful, right? And that's just from an FDM machine that you that anybody on this call could have access to. So, um, and then here's Josh working his magic. And here's where the real art form comes in. You can see when I sculpted this head, um, I did this, a, a little bit of this in ZBrush, the blast. It was supposed to have like a blast that had went through it. So I took one side and kind of bent the metal in ZBrush and kind of sculpted it. And then I had the backside kind of flare out, but it was a canvas for him to go in and add additional wiring, scorch marks with the paint. Yeah. Um, it's a team effort, right? It's not just like the printer does everything. Could I have printed wires out of PLA? Sure, but <laughs> let's just use real wires, right? And he's a master of his craft. Josh is amazing. He does all of the props, his, him, him and his team on the, uh, on the Mandalorian series. Mm -hmm. Here you can see right through it. That was actually the shot, the show, if you guys remember. There's a, a shot where Mayfeld comes down and we, the camera looks right through it. It was Rick's episode. Uh, yeah, and as you're saying, like even like, you know, as, as, you, as he zoomed in into those wires, printing that with any type of machine would be just impossible. And you would never get that wiggly sort of Moving yeah, you wouldn't be able to pose it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you want to be able to art direct it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this one I listed as hybrid miniatures. And the reason that I did that is if you guys are familiar with a lot of the stuff that Industrial Light Magic did in the past, we're, we're known for a lot of miniatures and stuff back in the day in the 80s and the big films. We still do that today. And in fact, a lot of people don't know this. We do it as much. It, it, it's just not, it's not as a thing that people talk about that, that much. But what's really cool about how we do it and that's why I put hybrid on here so you guys could kind of remember that. We used to build an entire miniature, and I'll show you an example here in a second after this next slide, but we used to build an entire miniature that was meant to be filmed. And what I mean by that is that was the thing, right? There was no like, after a while it got to where you could augment that stuff with visual effects. But if you were gonna build a whole thing, that was gonna be the thing. Now we are a little bit more strategic about that with the tools that we have available today. So if there's just, if it's a round room, we'll build just a pizza pie slice of that room, focus all of our effort from the model built makers on that. And they can add more detail, right? Because if they did the whole room, their time gets watered down. But if we can focus on that wedge, then we can scan that wedge and, and then duplicate it in the computer around. And now we have the best of both worlds. We have that rich, real thing that was made of a, a combination of scratch build and 3D prints and hand paints. And then we can go in and trick it out and add a little, a few additional things in CG, but that's a part of the magic for me. It's not like one or the other. It's, that's the best stuff that we do is when we do a little of both. The first example I'll show you is the Razor Crest. So we had a series of shots, as you guys are familiar with, that's the famous ship from the Mandalorian um, that Mando used to fly around. We used a lot of different print techniques for this. We used the FDM machines for the structure. So this bone-like stuff that's down here, that was that, that uh, structure inside so that you could mount different cameras, mount it differently depending on the shot that we needed. And that's a trick from back in the day. And I didn't know that I got that from John Goodson, who I'll show you in a second. Why you have to mount it differently, for those of you who don't know, is if you do a miniature shoot, if you have a big hole where that thing is going to screw into, you can't have that be visible in another angle when they fly over the top, right? So you have to have this little magic trick where you can pop off a panel, that's where you can mount it for that. And then when you unmount it, you pop the panel back on and you can pop the belly panel off for the shots where it flies and banks the other way. So there's a lot of engineering that goes into miniature ship builds. And then this top thing, like I said, that structure was all FDM. This top one was we did in resin. So I had to break all these panels down. I think I printed this on two form twos they were running for 24 hours a day just to get all those panels to Goodson. And he would pick those up as they would come out just so he could work on them, add additional detail because ultimately he wanted to make a mold from mm -hmm. that ship. And here's a little piece that I'll let play. This is about four minutes long or so. It looks like six minutes. Um, this is, a, I want to let this play because this tells the whole story. This is, this is Doug Chang working on the Razor Crest design. And Ryan Church worked on this as well. You'll see in a second of Doug looking over his shoulder. And Doug's a legend, if you if you guys aren't familiar with. He designed the N1 that you might have seen in the latest uh, in the latest series. 
Here's Ryan Church in the art department. You see Christian Alzman in the background and Doug's just looking over the shoulder, working with Ryan on any type of details. We're trying to nail it down before we go and make this miniature because you don't want, you want there to be continuity. So it's always a race, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get as many notes in as you can before they start to shoot this thing and start that process. Here's Rene Garcia. He went in and made the 3D model and tricked all of that stuff out of the, for concept from the art department. So he's starting to go in there, add all the detail. He's not worrying how we're going to make it. He's just trying to flesh out in 3D the ideas that Doug and Ryan have nailed down. Mm -hmm. Here's Jay Machado. He's going through and painting that ship. So he's going in in the computer. And um, I think at this time, he, yeah, he's got Mari open here. So he's painting all of that chipping and weathering. But this stuff, even though it's digital, is going to inform the miniature build. Yeah, It's a back and forth, right? And then when we get the scans from the miniature build later, they're going to work some of those magic uh, happy accidents that may have happened into the miniature, into the digital one. So there's got to be continuity. Here's me chopping that up. There was a, they put a little maquette on my desk of the, of the Razor Crest. I think that was a little metal print that they had done. I love that copper look of that. Yeah, it was fun. I had that on my desk while I was working. You can see I've got two Form 2s running here in this case, um, just for that exterior shell. Mm -hmm. And in the background there, there's some panels and there's just panels running all day long that would, that would, and if you're wondering why we made a mold of it, could we have done this all with the resin printer or all with that? We could, but we want it to be strong. We want John to be able to work his magic. And you'll see in a second of getting it just right. And some materials work better than others. Mm -hmm. So this was just to make a master. And you'll hear me say that again in a second, the master, the, the, the master that we'll make a mold from. So here's all those, the support materials. And then here's John Goodson. It says miniatures unit. That's actually in his garage. And you can see him working some of the parts. Mm -hmm. He's That's one of the engine pieces of the engine there. And wow. this guy's a legend. I don't know if you've seen, he had a lot of his ships on exhibit uh, at the Mandalorian experience last mm -hmm. week in celebration as well. And this is one of the ships that was on, on display. Here you can see he's working out the lighting. Uh, yeah. John, John Noel, who you're going to see here in a second, worked out all of the lighting of the LEDs in the engine. He programmed all of that stuff. And if you haven't heard of John Noel, he's a genius. Um, he and his brother, here's John Noel working on the machining of the motion control rig that he designed and made. Um, John Noel and his brother made Photoshop. So this, this isn't, uh, he's kind of a household name. Absolutely. And here you can see John is working on, uh, John Goodson is working on that surface, just getting it mm -hmm. just right. He's starting to make the mold now and it molds is an art in itself. You can destroy yep. the thing that you're making the mold of, if, for those of you who don't know. So this is a very, you can see we were down to the wire. We didn't have two shots of this. So his experience of doing this for years is what we relied on. There's John Knoll, and that's in his own personal shop. Uh, he's got his own machine shop. He's working on making the entire track that we shot these miniature shots on. And if you're wondering why we're doing this, don't we have a 3D model? Why don't we just do it on the computer? We could have done it in the computer, but John and Dave wanted to have John Favreau and, and Dave Filoni wanted to have that magic for the fans of some of the shots feel like they did back in the day. We even broke, and you'll see Hal's going to come up here in a second. Here's Hal right there, perfect timing. We even broke some of the backgrounds so that just like back in the day, the stars would swim a little bit different out of sync with the ship when it flew by because we wanted it to have that feel. It's yeah. that meticulous detail. Here you can see um, Hal and I were able to go and mock up some of the shots and I say mock up, they were the shots that was ended up being programmed for the motion control rig. But John Knoll made a rig for us in the computer that matched the rig that he made in real life. So that I was going to say that's kind of crazy. It's, it's like crazy. Basically building it in real life and then bringing it back in the computer just to have everything match. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. And it added a lot of magic to it. And again, it's that illusion, right? Like mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. like when we use the LED volume, could we shoot everything on the LED volume? I guess. Could we yeah. shoot everything out in the back lot in, in LA under the sun? We could, but it's that magic of what's the right tool for the job. And here you can see the camera going down and shooting a path. It has to shoot multiple passes. <laughs> yeah. And that was the camera move for that. And here you can see John. John actually made the whole Arduino board and everything, John Knoll. Mm -hmm. So not only did he design the rig, he, he made the electronics, he programmed yep. it, everything. And that's on the ILM stage. Here you can see they're, they're setting up for the next shot. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's slow movement of that camera going down the rail. And as it gets closer, if the ship's supposed to do a bank, it's slowly yep. doing a little bank of its own while the camera goes by it. All mm -hmm. of that stuff we, we obviously pre-programmed in the computer ahead of time and sent it. Yeah. And what was really fun about this is like, obviously we use a lot of real time now, right? Um, when we were doing this though, it was kind of funny because when it was done, you're like, oh, it, we've got it. It's like a render that you have the photos from that thing. And in a, in a weird way, you're like, oh, I already have the shot right here. Obviously we did comp work in that on top, but yeah, it was really fun. Um, so hybrid miniatures, another one. So that was a ship. I wanted to show you guys a ship. 
here's an environment. And this is the last, the last bit here before we get to the questions that I wanted to show you guys. Mm -hmm. We had to make an environment that was going to be a junkyard. Obviously, we can't just have cars and fenders and everything in there. We need it to be a Star Wars junkyard. So we need even children to be able to identify some of these iconic shapes. We could go take like an X-Wing and take a, a panel or a fender off of it and stick it in the corner. But even that is still hard to identify. So what we needed to do first was figure out in our universe, what are some iconic things, some iconic shapes, and how to not make those too granular and chop them up to where you lose the, the, the design language of it. You lose that, mm -hmm. that from eye. So of course we have, the tie fighter. So what we did was we thought, all right, we'll we'll keep the tie ball in the frame. And I actually have one here. This is what we ended up keeping. I don't know if you guys can see. We wanted to keep this intact. Even if we took the ball off, that's okay. Maybe you take this iconic um, window frame off as well, but you don't want to get too granular because you'll lose people. So we wanted to have, instead of fenders and hoods and all that, we'd stack wings, right? We could go and we do this sometimes, right? We could have went to Lucasfilm franchising and uh, franchise and find out what is the merchandise we have available to us at what scales. And maybe uh -huh. we can just work from that and paint it and trick it out and add additional detail that the toy might not have in it. Unfortunately, there wasn't the scale that we needed for a model build for the show. Those toys are made at a specific scale for a reason, right? There's a variety of reasons why they make them the size that they are. So we needed to do our own. Mm -hmm. um, so this here is when I went and figured out this is the scale we're going to work at. Jason Mahakian is the one that did this model build. So I wanted to make sure that the print was going to be big enough for him um, to where he could get enough detail. For those of you who aren't familiar with model making, if you, if you go really big, you get all the detail in there of all the drips and that looks great, but it becomes unwieldy, right? If it's too big. Um, storage, everything about it. Yep. If you go too small, that's nice. It's a quick 3D print. It's a quick model build. It doesn't take up much space, but it looks like a toy. So right. that's the balance that you have to strike. And thankfully, Andrew Jones, who's an amazing production designer, he knew very intimately that that relationship. And him and I and Jason Mahakian worked through that to figure out the right scale. I then, just like with the Massive, chopped up all of those panels from that, from the design of the TIE Fighter. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't want to just bandsaw across a smooth surface because that's what's really nice about the tie ball, right? It's that nice, smooth panel, and then you get a little greedly tech and then a panel yeah. line. So I cut it along those panel lines and printed all those parts so that when you put it back together, like Jason Mahakian did, there isn't all these crazy support material structures and everything. We hid that. I made sure the supports were always on the ugly side of inside the shell when you put it mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And here he's making a master. Remember I said that term earlier. The reason he makes the master is because he can make a mold. And look at how beautiful that mold is on the left. Sometimes you'll see those online. It's whatever gets the job done. But that looks like a piece of furniture that he did. That nice wooden box. Uh -huh. Everything about it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. The reason he did the mold is, again, we could have 3D printed a bunch of these TIE, tie fighter bodies, right? But what's nice about banging them out and, and those copies on the right is they're actually very pliable as well. They almost come out like those cheap Halloween masks that are kind of thin, like from the 80s and 90s yeah. um, with the little rubber band. We can mangle those and that's what he did. So here you can see he's made a bunch of those copies and he's ripped them up so they look unique. That's and he hasn't painted them yet. He just did them with the primer <laughs> gray, but this is all from the 3D print, right? Yeah. You see all these pieces he's making for himself as like a kit of parts to put this junkyard together. Mm-hmm, mm hmm, mm -hmm. And then next, what really brings the magic out is the paint. So this paint trick is really cool. If you guys are doing, you know, I don't know how many of you guys are doing a lot of rusty things with your 3D prints. I think the first time I'd ever heard about this was, was, a, was an ILM person. It was, it was actually John Goodson who told me about this. And I think that was a trick they used to use back in the day a lot. Now you can get paints that do this. Um, but it essentially has iron filings in the paint. And you paint a brand new thing. It could be something that you just bought at the store. Yeah. And then you um, activate it with, I, I think you can use vinegar, to be honest, if you use uh -huh. uh, iron, iron filings, and it oxidizes. And you got to be careful. If you go to town and just soak this sucker, and then you go inside to grab a coffee and come back out, it'll look yellow, like it's completely <laughs> rusted. So this is actual rust. It does mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to be careful, too. You can't leave it outside if it's a very humid environment where you guys live. Uh, but it works, and it works wonderful. And if you do it, just remember that I say this to you trust it. You're going to paint the paint on there and it's going to be like a black, dark gray. And then you're going to spray this stuff and you're like, that Landis guy was crazy. I ruined my print. Thanks a lot. And you're going to go inside. You're going to come back out and it's going to look beautiful. Mm. It, it's like, it's like watching water boil. You got to don't watch it. It'll happen. <laughs> this is 
I'm kind of cheating here. I, I put an image from the exhibition last week that we did, the Mandalorian Experience, because we brought this giant diorama to the exhibit so that all the fans could enjoy it. That's what that image is on the right. But on the left, you can see there's a couple of close-ups of all the details. Yeah. Now, did we use just 3D prints? No. There's also even cartridges. I don't know if you can see my, yeah, you see my mouse. There's cartridges to a 2D printer here uh -huh, that have uh -huh. been used as little tanks. There's like lids to like mayonnaise jars in here and stuff, all kinds of things that just are a nice shape that out of context, you can't really tell what they are. Now, remember I told you, we could have built this whole thing as a gigantic junkyard, but we knew we just wanted some little funky shape, you know, wasn't very unique that we could duplicate and hide the fact that we've made copies. So we made just that piece, we scanned it in. And these are some bug lights on set. We want to capture it. We could light it artistically mm -hmm. and creatively and make it all moody, but we don't want to do that. We want to do that in the computer. So we're blasting the sucker with as much light as we can so that it's neutral, so that we can relight it later in the game engine. And then eventually, ultimately on the wall yeah. in real time with stagecraft. So here's me taking that scan. You can see the ice spider is a little Easter egg over here in the corner. <laughs> here's me taking that scan and scouting it in VR. And this is what we'll do. We'll take that scan. We'll shrink ourselves down or scale it up if you, however you want to look at it. And we scout it. And what scouting means is the director gets in there the production designer, the visual effects supervisor, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, department, if we're going to have plants in there, if we're going to have any kind of mounds of dirt, everybody, set decorators. And we plan out in VR, even the miniatures that we've 3D printed and built so that we can figure out how we're going to do it. Where are we going to put the camera? The DP's in there with a virtual camera trying to figure out where there's going to be some shots of this thing. Maybe we start out inside that little area we were calling the break room. It looks like a little table where if people worked there. Um, they could set and, and have a sandwich or something. Who knows, right? We're just trying to find some magic moments inside of that. And then ultimately, we put that up on the wall. So this is a bunch of screen grabs from our pre-light sessions where we planned out all of the lighting of that scanned mm -hmm. miniature. We have the miniature model diorama itself that we brought down on set the day we shot so that all of the actors and everybody could enjoy that. We didn't have to do that. And then here in the background, you can see that scan of that 3D print hybrid miniature is being projected on that LED wall. It looks a little funky from my view of my phone here, but from that camera that's on that techno crane, it actually lines up perfectly. Yeah. And if those of you who aren't in, uh, familiar with the stagecraft process, this is all live. This isn't like a 360 photo or a 360 video being projected on a wall. That is all live and has parallax. So as the camera moves, you, it's all live. You can grab things, hide them. You can put lights in there. It's, it's all mm -hmm. dynamic. And here you can see once you layer uh, special effects of sparks and smoke and the actors and everybody on it, it sells it. We also have some full-size things you can see here, a walker in here. And oh, also, speaking of walker, we had Phil Tippett, and you guys may be familiar with him. He's a legend back in Star Wars days, uh, in, in the beginning of the Star Wars days. He did a whole stop motion walker in the background of the final version, if you go and watch this episode. Um, so we had stop motion in there, 3D prints, all the new and the old tech. It was just, it's really cool. That's amazing. What type of 3D printers do you use? Starting with just process oriented questions now. Uh, we use a mix of FDM machines, as you guys could see. We use a variety of uh, FDM machines, not just MakerBot, we use all kinds. Um, we even have one where it's like a giant Creality machine that we use sometimes. Um, and then we also use resin printers. Um, and then, as I told you, I, I don't want to speak too much on behalf of Technoprops because I want to get Robbie in here. He'll tell you all of the different printers that he uses from Stratasys to all kinds of other things. And yeah, it's we use all of it. And like I said, it's the right tool for the job, right? Advantages and disadvantages of using 3D printed props and which materials do you use? To come? The advantages of 3D printing props. 3D uh, one printed of the big yeah. ones is so it depends, right? Um, Josh props, and maybe we can get him to do a talk. That would be great. Mm. Josh, if you if you see a lot of the stuff that they build for props, there's actually different types of props, even for the same thing. So for those of you who don't know, let's say you have a bunch of background extras and they're carrying some kind of like blasters, right? The stormtroopers. The ones that are, are in the background are more durable. They might be like more of a rubber and they hold up good from a distance. Um, as you get closer and more hero, and if it's maybe the main actor that's carrying it and it's right up front, those are real metal. They really like do everything and, mm -hmm. and they, they sound amazing. 
those have to be durable. So we will augment those things, but it depends on the use case, right? Remember I said, it's the right tool for the job. If we 3D print something and it needs to be strong, but we needed to design it in the computer because we have a design that may have come from Doug Chang and you can't kit bash it, right? If it's like a crazy helmet, that's not something you could really kit bash. If it's a smooth designed helmet, we have to get that out of the computer. So we'll 3D print it, sand it, and then uh, make copies of it. And I actually, the screen grab that you guys saw from the banner, that was the advertisement for this. Um, I actually have it here. And, and again, I, I want Jay to do a talk, Jay Machado, but this mm-hmm. is a helmet that he did and he could do a whole workshop with you guys, a demo on this sucker. Um, and, I, and I actually had a slide of all the images. We have a th- group thread and you guys should do this with your friends where yeah. you share things that you're working on with each other. I have a plethora of material that he sent me of molds that he's made of all of this whole process of how he 3D printed this. Mm -hmm. This was all FDM. Mm -hmm. This was, um, I think a resin print here and this was a resin print, but I don't want to give too much away because I want him to do a talk. I'm trying to push Uh, him as well to do one of these. would be awesome actually. Yeah, but this is an FDM print. This Mm -hmm. thing had horrible build lines when it came out of the printer, but did he just say that was going to be the one? No, he sanded it, bonded it. He's really good about that, made copies. So yeah, even if he could have had a good print out of that, it's more resilient in the material that he chose to use so yeah. 3d printing is just a means to an end remember it's just a tool and it's funny like also like with fdm on also and you know if you were to use sla maybe your a surface will be super smooth but you have the back end being all covered with the support material so it's always kind of like a balance of choosing the right not even tool when it comes to 3d printing but within 3d printing the right tool of 3d printing sla fdm and so on how do you choose to use models in standing versus bfx uh added on uh, later on to the scene? That's a good question. You know, I, one of the things that I love about John Favreau and Dave Filoni is they have a love for this stuff as fans. They, Filoni, I don't know if you know, he makes m- train models on his own time. They, they, they do this stuff. They're just like the people on this call. They enjoy making things. They draw, they write. So they're not just like directors, right? So when you get folks like us who are in that position, mm-hmm. they of course want to use those things. Um, we're, we have to be really smart about it. We can't just do everything like that, yeah. right? Um, we want, again, use the right tool for the job. But what's really, you know, it, it can't be understated that it, it, you have to remember that those guys have the vision and support mm-hmm. to use these things. They support us to be able to use printing and models and all of that stuff because it could just be easier to take the 3D thing in the computer and use yeah. that all the time. And that works great a lot of times, but sometimes you need that extra little magic that you could sprinkle in there from a 3D print that was then painted on top of, somebody put some pieces on top of that, and it becomes this beautiful thing that even masters of their craft in the computer acknowledge the beauty of that chaos that you, you, you can't really grasp when you're trying to do it all. You know, you, it feels very contrived sometimes. Even the masters that do this in the computer will tell you that they look for things. Um, using AI to generate stuff for, for inspiration, looking at shapes around, uh-huh. around you every day. So, yeah. so what type of programs do you use for 3D modeling and 3D design? You know what's really great? Um, it doesn't, I, and I hate to say this because I used to hate when, when I was going to school and people would say, it doesn't matter. And you're like, hey, I need to buy something. So please tell me. <laughs> yeah. um, what's really cool is you can, depending on what you want to do, if you're trying to 3D print something, mm. you can get away with, Um, It it depends on how detailed it is that you're trying to do, right? It's a really hard question to answer. If you're trying to do a crazy transformer thing, which we've done in the past, part of the design language of transformers is it just, it needs to be busy. Mm -hmm. And there's so much stuff. Most people's computer couldn't even open like the leg of Optimus Prime, right? (laughs) And we have like 50 transformers fighting each other. Um, Guns blasted and everything and explosions and stuff. So that is a different kind of animal. Um, But there's ways to break things down. You have to be smart about it, right? Just like when we 3D print and you break things down, you take it one step at a time. John Noll always says, if you you break down a a hard problem, you can get all the way to the moon if you just do it one problem at a time. So that's the same way you should approach it by what you have. If you have a computer that has a decent video card, maybe it's not an RTX, you can't do ray tracing, right? You might not be able to do ray tracing in Unreal, but you can still get into Unreal and start lighting things. You can still make stuff in Maya or Blender or whatever you have access mm-hmm. to and, and start 3D printing. And MakerBot Cloud Print, I don't know if you guys have used that and a lot of the other things, it doesn't really care what your, your processor is. You can do it from the cloud. That's the whole point, yeah. right? So 
I send prints sometimes from my phone to the, to the, to the cloud and it will show like, Oh, these are the printers that you have available. It's really cool. I wish I had that like 10 years ago. <laughs> it's all about what you have at hand. We get that question a lot. Like, Oh, do, do I need like a method to, to print or do I need a smaller one? Like the sketch over here. And uh, the answer is always whatever you have at hand and whatever you can use, it's always the best tool that you can get, uh, you know, get access to anyway. Yeah, that's right. If you, if you ask, uh, if you ask photographers, there's an age old saying, right. Um, that the best camera is the one you have on you. And that's why the phones are so great now. Cause we have cameras on them, right. It doesn't matter if yeah. you have an amazing DSLR, if it's yeah. so heavy that you never want to bring it with you, it just sets in the closet. Right. Yeah. The same thing is true with printing. A lot of people get caught up in gear and it's very easy to do. It's mm -hmm. we're programmed as people to procrastinate with things and be scared to do them, right? And finish yeah. them. So if you have a little printer that you built for 200 bucks, that's what you have, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. use that print. Look at all those techniques I showed you, yeah. the wires on them, paint it. And someone will look at that and go, wow, man, what printer do you have? You'll see, that's what question a lot. And you'll think to yourself, I actually have a terrible printer. But that's what I had and I used, I was clever with it and I used my ingenuity and I, and, and I looked at techniques that other people use and I put lights in there and that's yeah. where the magic is, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that people who are pros will tell you is it's not so much about can I build it faster than the computer or can I build it faster than that 3D printer would have done? Mm -hmm. It's that it's doing that. It's like a little robot that's running so I can do something else. Exactly. So if you only have four people on your team, then that printer helps you. It's, it's running. It's going constantly overnight. It's doing anything that you can think of to use that as the right tool for that job, right? So what are some tips to get started in the 3D printing industry specifically for like, how did you end up in ILM and what about like students? Uh, for students specifically. So I was an artist when I was younger. And then at some point I actually joined the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a big part of, if you look at like my whole story, I am very much like a creative technical person. Uh -huh. Everything I do, whether it's like deep fake stuff that we do, 3D printing, it's always a mix of tech and, and creative. But when I was in the Air Force, I met my wife. When we were getting ready to deploy to go to the desert, um, back in the day, we would always go to the bookstore. That's what you do. You're getting ready to go to the middle of the desert for three months. So you get wow. a bunch of books to put in your rucksack yeah. and take with you. That's so great. one of the things that she came back with for me when, one day when we, we were in the bookstore, uh -huh. she said, I got a bunch of these 3D computer books that George Lucas uses some of the software. And at the time I was like, George Lucas, okay, cool. I wasn't like, oh, wow. Like I'm going to learn this because I want to work on Star Wars someday. That was not a thought in my mind. And she said, maybe you take these with you. There was one book on Blender, one book on Max, and one book on Maya. And I put those in my rucksack, went to the desert. And in the middle of the night when I wasn't, I was an avionics guy, so I worked on fighter jets in, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was back in the tent and the other shift was working, because it's 24-hour ops, right? I would be in the tent and I didn't want to wake up my buddies on the cot. And I had my sleeping bag over my head. And, and I was reading these books. And then when I came back from that trip, I told my wife, I said, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I want to, I, after I get out of the air force, I want to go and I want to do this. So at the time I didn't have money for Maya on that. I use Maya and all that stuff now, but I, I got blender and this was like 21 years ago, at least, right? Mm -hmm. Like blender now is a big hot thing, but I'm telling you guys, it didn't used to be again. I used what I had access to. Mm -hmm. I posted stuff online. There was only like four forums at the time. It just snowballed from there. And I just, I just kept, kept with it. And I was lucky enough to get a job. I got a, if you guys have access to get a, an internship or anything, do it. I actually ended up paying my school to take a class class that was actually an internship. So I was paying <laughs> to work at that place and it was giant killer robots. I learned so yeah. much from that place. And then eventually they made me an employee. Uh -huh. It was wonderful. So any, t any opportunity you can to get something and do something, do it. Mm -hmm. Don't sit around and be like, is this the best thing? Is this the best software? Is this the best printer? Should I really be getting paid a fortune and be driving around in a Ferrari to get my first internship? No, because you don't know what you're doing, right? They're paying <laughs> no. you to teach you how to do this stuff. So mm -hmm. do it. That's the best thing that I can say is just get in there and, and roll your sleeves up and fail and learn and, and, Another one is, and I know I'm dragging it out, get with a group of people that 
surround yourself with people, not just positive people, but people who are also into this, tag team it, right? Maybe you can't do design work or you're going to eventually get a designer buddy and, and have them do something. And then you do it and then you model it or you find somebody to model it and you 3D print it and just get together because that's just like having somebody at the gym that's like a workout partner. They inspire you. And yep. we all have that, that all work in the industry. We all are constantly inspiring each other and lifting each other up. So. Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Landis. Thank you so much for all of you guys out there for joining. And I, I hope that you had a good time as uh, I did. I thank all you guys for coming. And I know that everybody watches the shows and the movies and everything, but just just know that's not something that's on, on a pedestal that you can't do. If you're out there and you're thinking like, man, I really want to do this, but no, I can't do this. Just keep doing it. You can do it hundred percent. You know, I never thought in a million years that I, that I'd be doing this stuff and I never went after it. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm working with these people who are legends do what you want to do and, and just print and have fun. Don't worry about it being perfect. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Uh, thanks again, Landis.